So age ain't nothing but a number, am I right? I think we've all heard or perhaps used that phrase at some point in our life, perhaps on the social scene when a younger suitor tries to ask an older individual on a date. That might be the reply if told, oh, but you're just too young for me. Or maybe when someone reaches that certain age and tries to put a positive spin on an otherwise unremarkable birthday, they may also use this phrase. In either case, this saying hints at an aspect of life that can often be a source of anxiety, dread, or maybe even fear. What am I referring to? The fact is, as we are all sitting or standing here experiencing this event, we are all aging right now. When we leave this event, we will continue to age, and we will do so for the rest of our lives, literally. Now, we all know this is true. It's said that there are only two certainties in life, death and taxes. <laughs> but is there anything we can do about it now to push that day farther into the future? Or at the very least, for however many years we may have remaining, to make sure that they are spent happy, healthy, and productive? Well, the revolution in the field of molecular biology has a lot to say on this topic and may give us clues as to how we can achieve this reality. But first, why do we age? It's some, uh, such a straightforward question, yet it is a question as old as civilization itself. A simple definition might be a progressive deterioration in physiological function accompanied with vulnerability and mortality as we age. It seems reasonable, right? I don't think anyone would necessarily disagree with that definition. Yet it is somehow lacking. It seems too fatalistic to think about aging as some inexorable march that simply moves forward with the passage of time without our being able to have any say about it. So, so scientists offer a fascinating new theory how to better and more precisely define the aging process in something called the epigenetic clock. So what do I mean by that? Well, the second word, clock, is a device used to measure, keep, and indicate time. It's one of the oldest human inventions. But that first word, epigenetics, might be less familiar to us. So what do I mean by that? Well, epigenetics is a term from the field of biology that refers to changes in gene expression that occur without altering the primary DNA sequence. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's look at some basic terms followed by an example. So genetics is a study of heredity, and collectively, our genes or genome is made up of DNA, which is in turn made up of tiny molecules A, C, G, and T. And it's the specific arrangement of these molecules, A, C, G, and T, that make up and are interpreted as genes. So how does epigenetics contribute? So let's look at an example. So the letters, let's pretend for a moment that the letters in these four simple words represent the sequences of our genome. So when arranged in certain ways, we can recognize them as words. And when given proper grammar plus context, they take on a very clear meaning. However, these very same words, when given different grammar, take on an entirely new meaning. In a similar way, epigenetics can be thought of as the grammar of our genome. In fact, the word epigenetics comes from the Latin epi, meaning above, plus gene, to literally mean anything on top of or above the level of a gene. And the purpose, biological purpose of epigenetics is to control gene expression. In other words, to turn genes on or off. And this is really important when we consider that all of the cells in our body contain the exact same genetic information. But during development, we all start out as a single cell, and as that cell begins to grow and divide, epigenetics kicks in to turn different genes on or off in a highly coordinated manner. And as they do, they give new cells different context and different meaning and allow them to develop so that we all have skin cells or neurons in the brain, cardiac cells in the heart, hepatocytes in the liver, bone cells, muscle cells, and so on. It's important to remember that whereas our DNA or genetics or our genes are static, in other words, they do not change throughout the course of our life, our epigenetics will change. We know through years of scientific research that the type of diet we eat, whether it's a healthy one or one high in sugar or unhealthy fats, whether we get enough exercise or lead a sedentary lifestyle, are we able to avoid stress, get enough sleep, do we smoke or drink to excess? All of these environmental factors will affect the epigenetics on top of our genes. So when you think about it philosophically for a moment, epigenetics really defines a process in which our own personal history or life experience is directly written onto our DNA, which is the very fabric of the material for the blueprint that makes us who we are. Now, just a few years ago, right here in Southern California, a scientist at UCLA named Dr. Steve Horvath, along with another group at UCSD led by Gregory Hannum, analyzed epigenetic patterns from thousands of individuals and found something truly remarkable. What they found was that epigenetic patterns change in a predictable manner as people age. They built a mathematical model to describe this relationship and called it the epigenetic clock to refer to the fact that it is able to measure biological time looking at epigenetic change. At Zymo Research, the company I work for, we have long had a dedicated interest in the field of epigenetics. 
So when we heard about the epigenetic clock, we enthusiastically embraced its potential. In fact, we built a clock of our own based largely off the ideas put forth by Dr. Horvath, and I show a representation of that here on, the, uh, on this uh, scatter plot. So what we have is the birth or chronological ages for hundreds of people in our database uh, plotted against the predicted age based on analyzing their epigenetics. And what we see is the clock performs extremely well. There's a very strong positive correlation between chronological age and epigenetic age. It's greater than 98%. In biology, if you're ever trying to correlate a given association with a certain observation, a correlation of 50% is already considered very good. So we're well above that here. Furthermore, the clock is accurate. It has a median error of just 1.9 years. So the epigenetic clock theory of aging allows us to quantify the biology driving the aging in our cells at the molecular level. And just to emphasize, we don't need to know anything special or know any personal information about someone in order to predict their age. All we need is a biological sample. Just a single drop of blood is enough. So just in the past year, a uh, very uh, interesting and unique application for the epigenetic clock came to light in the field of forensic science. So in Europe right now, there's millions of migrants entering from all over the world, and this poses something of a crisis for society over there. And it's a particular challenge for government when you consider that adults and adolescents are to, be, are to be treated differently according to the law. So there's a group of law enforcement officials over there investigating a case where an asylum seeker, excuse me, a refugee is seeking asylum as a minor, uh, and these uh, government officials had no way to independently verify the age of this individual because he didn't come with a passport, there's no birth certificate, no official documentation at all. So they approached us asking if perhaps we could use the epigenetic clock to assign an age to this person. We enthusiastically agreed, seeing a new opportunity to apply our clock in a different setting, and we wrapped up our uh, investigation with our counterparts in Germany about a year ago and submitted a formal report to the Office of Foreign Affairs there. Now, I don't have time to go into all the details of the report. But once it became a matter of public record, it sparked off a debate in German media about the proper way or potential to use the epigenetic clock in order to make sure that government assistance is applied to adolescents in a judicious manner and according to the law. The story crossed over into English language media, and uh, an editorial as well as a news feature was published in the journal Nature just last month. Even the BBC program Newsday ran a news feature on this a few weeks ago. And for that, I was able to talk to the host, and uh, in discussing the clock with him, he had this idea that, well, can we use an epigenetic clock to perhaps test athletes involved in youth sports? It's something that had never occurred to me at the time, but as soon as he mentioned it, I thought, why not? Now, I don't know how the clock would perform under that scenario, but it would be easy enough to test. And that's one of the really interesting things about using the epigenetic clock. It makes the study of age and aging so accessible. Lots of research groups are beginning to incorporate this tool into their own research, and we're seeing all sorts of interesting observations. So we see that uh, the aging rate is uh, accelerated uh, during youth and uh, puberty as, as children are growing up. It then levels off during adulthood, and this makes sense, right? We know that kids are constantly growing, and this biology should be reflected in the clock. We also see that men age faster than women. And this, too, should come as no surprise. So we've known for centuries and for societies all over the world that women have a longer life compared to men. Though I do think it's interesting that we can measure that change at the epigenetic level. As I've been saying, environmental and lifestyle influences will also affect the rate of aging. And this should be re reflected in epigenetic clock, too. So a recent study coming out of Harvard looking at miners and factory workers exposed to toxic levels of pollutants in China showed evidence of accelerated, raging, uh, accelerated aging in these individuals compared to those that, that aren't exposed to such pollutants. We see that cancer tissue will age at a faster rate compared to normal tissue. Also, those exposed to chronic stress are subject to accelerated aging, although interestingly, acute stress does not seem to have such an effect. And the implications for the clock and its use are expanding beyond just human research. So it turns out that the human epigenetic clock can actually be applied to chimpanzees, and it works reasonably well. There's also new clocks being developed for laboratory mice for the study of aging. There's also a whale clock available for marine biology research. And just recently, uh, a dog epigenetic clock was actually developed. So you can imagine at some point in the near future being able to take your family pet to the veterinarian at its next checkup and have its biological age, age tested. But for me, the implications and use of the epigenetic clock are far more profound uh, for, to benefit society 
um, and uh, understand aging um, and go well beyond just looking at uh, forensic science or even youth sports. You see, for thousands of years, mankind has been trying to understand this question of aging. If we look at the ancient texts, we see all sorts of references to aging and growing old. So in the Epic of Gilgamesh, uh, our hero is, uh, we're told, is searching for a plant for anyone who comes in contact with it, it is said to rejuvenate or make them youthful again. If we look at the Hebrew Bible, we see all sorts of references to very long-lived individuals, Methuselah having lived for over 900 years being the prime example. In the West, uh, there's often been an obsession with youth, and uh, as this is exemplified perfectly by this Renaissance-era Lucas Cranach masterpiece, The Fountain of Youth, in which we see the elderly enter the fountain on one side and come out rejuvenated on the other side. This can be contrasted with Eastern tradition, which teaches us that age is often associated with wisdom and is therefore celebrated to a certain degree. But whatever the societal attitudes, both East and West must come to the grips with the fact that in the coming decades, the global average age is set to increase dramatically. And with increased age comes a much higher instance of chronic disease. So as we get older, our chances of developing cancer increase. We see more instances of heart disease, also neurological disorders such as Alzheimer's and so on. With chronic disease comes an increase in mortality. So something like two-thirds of all death can be attributed to chronic disease. It's also costly. Approximately 75% of healthcare costs in the United States is consumed by treatment of chronic disease. So what can we do about this? What kind of steps can we take? If only we could find a fountain of youth similar to what Cranach envisioned so many years ago. Even a modest increase in healthy life extension of just 2.2 years could translate into $7 trillion in saving over the next 50 years. Well, it turns out that healthy life extension is in fact possible. There's no dispute about this. Science is very clear on this. The only caveat being this has only been demonstrated in model organisms and in experimental settings. So we can see that a single-celled organism such as yeast can have very robust life extension. Also, uh, C. elegans, a tiny worm, is, in certain instances, has also been able to show life extension. Fruit flies can live longer. And just more recently, we even see in more complex organisms such as mice that in certain instances, healthy life extension is possible. Now, there are all sorts of uh, efforts led by government uh, research institutes, private research institutes, uh, academic universities, um, biotech and pharmaceutical industries, hospitals, trying to take the lessons and biological pathways learned from these model systems and translate those into anti-aging interventions that can be applied to humans. So some of these include uh, from the pharmaceutical industry, developing different drugs and drug combinations. There's a movement in Silicon Valley right now looking at big data. So Google's parent company Alphabet has invested millions in this field of research. Uh, some people also think that stem cell transplant or stem cell therapy is a viable option. Also caloric restriction, a form of severe dieting, has also been proposed. Now all these interventions are based on, for the most part, very sound science. It's just up to us to identify the most effective ones, and we need to do it as soon as possible. The challenge comes in understanding that it's very difficult to identify which of these treatment strategies are having the most positive effects if we don't have any good biomarkers or measurements to look at aging. But with the epigenetic clock, at last we have a tool to measure changes in our cells at the biological level that are affecting time. In other words, we can use the epigenetic clock as a tool to test these anti-aging interventions. So how might this work? So we can look at some actual data here. So shown here, I have three different groups of individuals um, for which we plot their chronological age against their epigenetic age. So the data points shown in blue are representative of a healthy or normal population. By contrast, the data points shown in red are epigenetic age predictions taken from individuals who are either HIV positive or who have Down syndrome, two conditions for which we know lifespan is affected. And what we can see is that the rate of aging in these HIV positive and Down syndrome individuals is actually accelerated compared to the population average. This third group, represented by the green data points, is actually epigenetic age measurements from the children of centenarians. So not people who live to 100, but actually we look at their children. And what we see is that the epi epigenetic clock slows down for this cohort. Now, I cannot tell you what factors it is 
that contribute to slowing of epigenetic aging in these individuals. This is just observational data. But the important point is that at last we finally have a tool for which we can measure any of these stem cell transplants or drug combinations or types of dieting. We can use the epigenetic clock to identify which of these have the most effect on the aging process. And you can imagine any anti-aging intervention you could possibly think of can be tested in a similar way. So for example, does exercise slow down aging? Well, I think so, but which one is best? Swimming, biking, or running? Maybe high-intensity interval training, but others might say something more leisurely, like going for a hike or gardening in your backyard is better for you. Well, we can check on that. Are you worried that perhaps you have too much carbs or gluten in your diet, and this might be affecting the rate at which you age? We can look at that, too. So as I wrap up here, I just want to leave you with some uh, brand new data. This stuff is, is less than one, one year old, for which the epigenetic clock indicates that aging can be affected by making lifestyle uh, uh, changes incorporating into our life. So if we look at diet, it turns out that people who consume poultry, fish, fruits, and vegetables will actually have a slower rate of aging compared to those that don't eat as much, as much of it. And of those four, it turns out fish seems to have the greatest impact. If we look at nutrients in the bloodstream, um, uh, carotenoids, a measure of fruit and vegetables in the diet. Also, um, uh, alpha and beta carotene, a type of antioxidants known as xanthins, are all associated with slower aging. Also, um, alpha tocopherol, the type of vitamin E found in olive oil, will slow down the aging clock. Conversely, gamma tocopherol, the type of vitamin E found in soybean and corn oil, seems to accelerate the aging clock. Higher levels of insulin, glucose, triglycerides, high blood pressure, uh, high BMI, poor waist-to-hip waist ratio. These are all factors that are also associated with accelerated aging. Also, so socioeconomic factors can contribute. So our level of education, our income, whether we do incorporate exercise into our, our daily routines, are all associated with slower aging. Interestingly, moderate alcohol consumption is also associated with slower aging. <laughs> It's true. <laughs> so uh, I encourage everyone to leave here today feeling inspired and to take comfort in the fact that although we currently do not have a fountain of youth, uh, there are anti-aging interventions and strategies being developed. And by using the epigenetic clock, we will be able to identify the most effective faster and more efficiently than has ever been possible before. But we don't have to wait for the government or big pharma to come up with a plan. We can start to do so ourselves today we can incorporate changes into our daily routines for which the epigenetic clock already shows us that our aging can be slowed. And if we do so, we hope to be able to at least take control of the passage of time at the biological level. And if we're successful, we will be able to mature gracefully into adulthood, middle age, our golden years, and beyond. Thank you. <laughs>